This conference is about contraception, what I call the madness of contraception. By chance, 18 years ago, on this very day, the 13th of May, the Feast of Our Lady of Fatima, the first apparition was on the 13th of May. I was in St. Mirren's Hall, not as grand as this, uh, in Paisley in Scotland, making a presentation called Scotland is Dying. It led, in fact, to interviews on the BBC. I was called in to do all various things. I was even invited to go to the Scottish government. Have the Scottish government done anything about it? No. The situation now in Scotland is that the country is still dying. It's madness. Don't they realize it? Well, because it is madness because if you are, in fact, reducing the number of babies on one side, what happens to the number of workers 15 years later, 16 years later, 17 years later? Well, obviously, if that goes down, that goes down. And we're not talking about ones and twos. We're talking about tens of thousands in Scotland, hundreds of thousands in the UK. It's madness. It's suicide. And there are, I would say one thing. You mentioned, Greg mentioned immigration. Let there be no doubt in anybody's mind that there are not enough skilled immigrants ready to come into this country alone, let alone the United States, all of Europe, Australia, New Zealand, and all the other countries that are desperate too for skilled labor. There aren't enough skilled workers. That's why our hospitals are running short of doctors, nurses, our IT people. We want IT people. Everybody's going on how important it is to get, but we mustn't let Brexit stop skilled workers coming in. We are desperate, and we're desperate because 50 years of contraception, enough for me. We need to identify how did we get to this position of utter, complete madness. Let's, in fact, turn to Father Linus Clovis, who will take us through, in fact, the situation as it was in 1968, what the, what the Pope then predicted, and what has that actually taken place. Father Linus Clovis. Today is the 13th of May, the Feast of Our Lady of Fatima. So we should begin by acknowledging her presence and asking her to be with us. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among men, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Our Lady of Fatima, pray for us. Ave Maria. My talk is called Four Prophecies and Four Sins. The background, in 1930, all Christian denominations held contraception to be immoral. This position was first breached when the Lambeth Conference of the Anglican Communion reversed its own decisions of 1908 and 1920, permitting married couples to limit their families under certain conditions by contraceptive practices. Although Pope Pius XI, with his 1930 encyclical, Casti Canubi, was quick to defend the perennial teaching of marriage over the next 30 years, all branches of Protestantism would follow the Anglican lead and would repudiate the ancient teaching. By the 1960s, with concerns for the rapid population growth, or so-called, the change social status of women, the debates about marriage and sex, and the stupendous scientific and technological advances, the world and society was changing, and a new age was dawning. Additionally, the advent of the contraceptive pill, the first hormonal and non-barrier contraceptive, raised new questions about the church's teaching. In a bid to address these new questions, a 72-member advisory pontifical commission consisting of theologians, sociologists, medical experts, and married lay people 
from a dozen different countries was established, running counter to the majority recommendation of this commission and sailing against the tide of world opinion as determined by political, financial, and ideological interests, for Paul VI, somewhat tardily but with commendable clarity, held fast to Christianity's perennial and constant teaching in the 1968 um, encyclical, Humanae Vitae, which was about the regulation of birth. There was, however, a new spirit abroad, a spirit of rebellion. And, not surprisingly, Paul VI felt not only the wrath of the world, but also the stinging rebuke of dissenting cardinals and bishops the outright objection of some bishops' conferences and the barbs of rebellious priests and theologians. Paul VI, while recognizing the accredity of the church's perennial teaching with modern sensibilities, requested the cooperation of public authorities, of scientists, of Christian households, of the medical profession, and of priests and bishops in what he called a truly great work without which, in quotes, man cannot find true happiness for which he yearns with all his being, end of quote. In his concern for the common good, the Pope also warned of the grave consequences of rejecting humanae vitae, which is the fruit not only of extensive and prolonged consultation, but also and above all of intense and profound prayer. He was asking the guidance of the Holy Spirit. The issue, contraception is not the same as birth control. Births can be controlled in many different ways. Some ways are morally good, such as abstaining from cohesion either periodically or permanently, while others, like abortion, are intrinsically evil. However, neither abstinence nor abortion is contraceptive. Contraception to prevent pregnancy requires a two-fold choice. First, the choice to engage in sexual intercourse, an act known to be open to the transmission of life. And second, the choice, and I'm quoting Pope Paul, the choice of any action which either before, at the moment of, or after sexual intercourse is specifically intended to prevent procreation either as an end or as a means. This is what the Pope said. It is the latter choice that is morally evil. And it is evil because it is a choice freely made to extirpate here and now the procre procreativity of a freely chosen act of sexual intercourse. Thus, contraceptive intercourse is not simply non-procreative, that is, one that does not, in fact, result in pregnancy, but it is actually anti-procreative. Um, that is, an attack on the goodness of the procreativity of marriage and of human sexuality. It is an act in and through which one denies the goodness of fertility and of coition being open to the transmission of life. For this reason, the Church, through Humanae Vitae, teaches firmly that the contraceptive choice is intrinsically evil. The procreate, procreative meaning of human sexuality and of the marital act is not a good of the biological order, which is essentially instinctive and subpersonal, but rather it is a good of the human person and consequently of God, the author of our procreativity. The contraceptive choice leads to an ingrained contraceptive mentality that rejects this good of the human person, of human sexuality, of marriage, and so reduces the marital embrace to nothing more than mutual masturbation. What was the reaction to the Pope's encyclical? Despite the very vocal ridicule, the hostility an ultimate complete indifference with which Humanae Vitae was generally received, there was substantial and significant support for the authentic Christian teaching on human sexuality. Its greatest defender and promoter was 
Saint Pope John Paul II, who in Evangelium Vitae and Familiaris Consortio, among other things, developed the magisterial teaching on family and life that is now the flagship of, Cat of Catholic sexual morality. This year, 19, um, this year, 2018, marks the 50th anniversary of the publication of Humanae Vitae. The encyclical has both promoters and detractors, and recent calls to review its teaching in light of Amoris Laetitia have brought consternation to the hearts of the former and hope to the latter. In the current climate where Catholic doctrine is being made subservient to a putative pastoral expediency, it is morally certain that any rereading of Humanae Vitae through the lens of Amoris Laetitia will result in further compromises with the culture of death. The asphyxation of Catholic sexual ethics and the evisceration, eviscerating of the Catholic faith. The Pope made four prophecies. The grand satanic stratagem from Eden to the present time is to deceive by offering first and foremost some sane, attractive, wholesome, counterfeit alternative to the divine will and commandments. Contraception, it is claimed, creates a level playing field between the sexes, and the pill in particular liberates women from nature's fertility cycle, and, and it endows them with decision-making power and a sexual independence stripped of the fear of pregnancy. The potential deleterious effect on individuals and on society of this sane, attractive, wholesome, alternative was foreseen by Pope Paul VI, who in Humanae Vitae, number 17, and in terms both general and specific, warned of the negative consequences of methods and plans for artificial birth control. Specifically, he warned that artificial birth control would lead to a general lowering of morality, that the man may lose respect for his wife, and that there will be government intervention in the most personal and private sector of conjugal intimacy, and that there would be a denial that there are any absolute limits to a human being's domination over his or her body and its functions. This is exactly what the Pope said. Humanae Vitae arrived on the full flood of the sexual revolution, a revolution whose ascendancy was established with the liberalization of divorce, the pharmaceutical approval of the contraceptive pill, and the legalization of abortion on demand. In challenging the spirit of the age, Humanae Vitae became undoubtedly the most controversial papal document of modern times, if not indeed of all time. We look at the four um, prophecies that the Pope made. First, the general lowering of morality. While warning that the widespread use of contraception would open wide the way for marital infidelity and the general lowering of moral standards, Popol appealed to common experience, which has shown that, quoting the Pope, human weakness, and especially the young, need incentives to keep the moral law, and it is an evil thing to make it easy for them to break that law. It is indisputable that the developed world has seen a catastrophic and widespread decline of morality, especially sexual morality, over the last half century. This decline is easily verified by the decrease in number of marriages and by the increase in the number of people cohabiting, as well as by the number of divorces, abortions, out-of-wedlock pregnancies, and sexually transmitted diseases. It is also a fact that these social ills have their genesis in contraception. The fear of pregnancy was a great deterrent from engaging in premarital sexual intercourse for most young men and women. But the easy availability of contraception has presented them with a sane, attractive, wholesome alternative, which leads them to believe that they can engage in premarital sexual activity responsibly. Additionally, 
governments have provided the legislation and the financial structures which have made the adoption of a sexually immoral, if not irresponsible, lifestyle easy. Although abstinence and chastity have had spectacular success in halting and even reversing the AIDS epidemic in the Philippines and Uganda, the decadent West has preferred the same attractive, wholesome alternative of the safe sex and the safer sex mantras, which have merely exacerbated moral decline. With the excuse of protecting children from pedophiles, from contracting AIDS, or from becoming pregnant, sex education programs, some bordering on the pornographic, are used in schools from kindergarten upwards. These children are not only robbed of their natural innocence, but also inducted into sordid sexual practices. The criminal activities of pedophile priests, parliamentarians, teachers, judges, relatives, or entertainers also contributed greatly to the moral decline, if only by generating cynicism among the general public. This cynicism is further aggravated by recent revelations of the immoral, abusive, and criminal activities towards women of influential public persons occupying positions of trust in Hollywood and in high government circles. The second prophecy of, the, of Paul VI was the loss of spousal respect. More specific, the Pope warned that there was a grave danger that a man accustomed to contraceptive practices would regard his spouse as a mere, quote in the Pope, a mere instrument for the satisfaction of his own desires. And disregarding her physical and emotional equilibrium, deprive her of the reverence due to her as his partner, whom he should surround with care and affection. This concern reflects what has come to be known as a personalist understanding of morality, which is based upon respect for the dignity of the human person. The church's teaching on contraception is designed to protect the good of conjugal love. When spouses violate this good, they do not act in, accord in accordance with their innate dignity, and thus they endanger their own happiness. Treating their bodies as mechanical instruments to be manipulated for their own purposes, they risk treating each other as mere objects of pleasure. St. Augustine addressed in his treatise, Marriage and Concupiscence, quoting, St. Augustine, I am supposing then that although you are not lying with your wife for the sake of procreating offspring, you are not for the sake of lust obstructing their procreation by an evil prayer or an evil deed. Those who do this, although they are called husband and wife, are not, nor do they retain any reality of marriage, but with a respectable name cover a shame. Sometimes this lustful cruelty, or cruel lust, comes to this, that they even procure poisons of sterility, which today, of course, we call oral contraceptives. Contraception, contraception, by removing the threat of pregnancy, proposes itself as a sane, attractive, wholesome alternative to the self-discipline required by the natural law. It also crowned men's desire for endless sex with a promise of endless joy as women are now regarded by men as being always sexually available. Additionally, this sane, attractive, wholesome alternative traded the balance which required men to take at least equal responsibility for an unplanned pregnancy for a power imbalance where now women have the full responsibility for avoiding pregnancy. This brought further disadvantages to women who, in their search for a husband, often had to sleep with him first. Contraception in practice, by neutering women, reduced sex to a mere matter of consent, thereby making marriage, courtship, and even romance indispensable. We don't need it because we have consent. The third warning the Pope gave was government intervention. 
The Pope also warned that should contraception be seen as a legitimate, legitimate means for limiting family size, quote, public authorities who care little for the precepts of the, that, of the moral law would be empowered to apply those same means as a solution to the problems of the community and to impose the use of contraception on its people. The net effect, he warned, would place, quoting again, would place in the hands of public authorities the power to intervene in the most personal and intimate responsibility of husband and wife. But Paul's third warning has been realized with tragic accuracy in both the developed and the developing worlds. With respect to the former, for instance, in a supposed attempt to reduce teenage pregnancy rate, government policies encourage teenagers of all ages to use contraceptives and require school, secondary schools to teach their students about responsible sexual relationships, while health authorities operate special teenage-friendly birth control clinics. The result is that younger and younger girls are drawn into the sexual vortex as they are pressured into sex or even raped by more experienced older boys. While government control is subtle in the developed world, it is brutal elsewhere, such as the forced abortion programs of China and India, where only one, or one child or two children per woman, respectively, is permitted. In both those countries, unborn girls have been the primary victims. In the developing countries of Africa, by tying loans and international aid grants to population control policies, pressure is brought on governments to enforce family planning programs on their populations, not infrequently, and despite the growing evidence that many parts of the world face not overpopulation but underpopulation, women are sterilized or fitted with contraceptive devices or drugs without their knowledge or consent. The fourth prophecy, no limit to the dominion over the body and its functions. The fourth warning, also remarkably prophetic, foresaw that whilst contraception initially claimed that the responsibility for procreating life should be left to the arbitrary decisions of men, ultimately it would be emboldened to deny any reverence due to the whole human organism and its natural functions, and to assert that there are no limits to the power of man over his own body and its natural functions. This final prophecy has been fulfilled with a vengeance. In the developed world, sterilization, both male and female, is perhaps the most widely used form of contraception. But the desire for an unlimited dominion over one's own body extends beyond contraception. With the, with the sophism, my body, my choice, Failed contraception led to the demand for abortion of the newly conceived child. At the other extreme, the production of test tube babies and the practice of surrogacy were early indications of a mindset that would refuse to accept the body's limitations. Presented as a sane, attractive, wholesome alternative to infertility, the egg and the sperm bank soon reduced the human procreation and the children to a marketable commodity. Equally, euthanasia and the use of organ transplanted from those who are nearly dead are not only sane, attractive, wholesome alternatives to palliative care, but also clear signs that all reverence for the human organism and its natural functions has been lost. Going even further, there are individuals who are so convinced they have absolute autonomy over their bodies that they do not hesitate, not infrequently with tragic consequences, to alter even their own physiological makeup, creating a subclass called transgender persons. This subclass, which endorses the mutilation of healthy bodies, not only facilitates the destruction of masculinity and of femininity, but also opens up a, Pandor a Pandora's box of confusion, generating transsexual, transracial, transspecies, transabled, and transomnia subgroups. Thus, Paul VI's prophecy is tragically fulfilled, since now subjective feelings trump objective reality, and some individuals, unable to accept themselves and their bodies, 
with its inherent potentials and limitations, mutilate their body in an effort to align it to their perceived feelings, desires, and even timetables. Sin, because this is what we are facing. Sin is fundamentally a revolt against God, originating from a love of self even to the contempt of God. Consequently, sin, which arises from a verse attachment to created things rather than to the creator, is offense against reason, truth, and right conscience. As we know, there are different kinds of sin. In regard to its genesis, sin is either original or actual. The cause and the source of original sin lies in the will of Adam, who, as head of the human race, rebelled against God and lost the gift of original justice for himself and for us, his descendants. Actual sin lies in the will of every individual who rebels against God by a free personal act and is, divide, and is divided into sins of commission and of omission. While the sin of commission is a positive act contrary to some prohibitory precept, a sin of omission is a failure to do what is commanded. A sin of omission, however, requires a positive act with the intention of not fulfilling a precept, or at least of willing something incompatible with its fulfillment. In considering their abhorrence, sins are classified as those of ignorance or of passion or, or infirmity, and of malice. Whilst regarding the activities involved, they are classed as sins of thought, word, or deed. Each sin can be distinguished according to its object or according to the virtues it opposes, by excess or defect, or according to the commandments it violates. Sins can also be evaluated according to their gravity, as moral or venial. The former is a grave violation of God's law, which destroys charity by turning one away from God, while the latter, the wounded, allows charity to subsist. For a sin to be mortal, three conditions must coalesce. Its object must be of grave matter, and the sin must be committed with full knowledge and deliberate consent. Grave matter is specified by the Ten Commandments, with some sins being more serious than others, such as murder being graver than theft, or violence against parents compared to violence against a stranger. Mortal sin presupposes knowledge of the sinful character of the act or of its opposition to God's law. It also requires consent sufficiently deliberate to be a personal choice. Sin creates a proclivity to sin, and by repetition, the same sinful acts engenders vice. Vices are linked to the capital sins from which all other sins proceed and results in a perverse inclinations that cloud conscience and corrupt the concrete judgment of good and evil. Thus, sin tends to both reproduce and reinforce itself, but it cannot destroy the root of the moral sense. Within the catechetical tradition, there are four particular sins that cry to heaven for vengeance. The blood of Abel, the sin of the Sodomites, the cry of the foreigner, the widow and the orphan, and injustice to the wage earner. So we're going to look at the fulfillment of the prophecies and the punishment that followed. Over the last 50 years, these four sins have been steadily integrated into the fabric of modern society. Their integration in the developed world is so far advanced that they have, certainly in the case of the first two, been decriminalized and given the status of civil rights. The last two sins are the outcomes sought by certain ideologues who, through government legislation, have been pushing for the demise of the traditional family. The mechanism for this social vault fast springs from the use of contraception and the mentality it has generated over the years. Therefore, the institutionalization of these sins can itself be regarded as a punishment for sin. 
the first of the sins, willful murder. Both natural law and the divine positive law forbid the deliberate termination of innocent human life. Genesis 4, 10 and 11 records the first homicide. With God berating Cain, what have you done? Listen, your brother's blood is crying out to me from the ground. And now you are cursed from the ground, which is open his mouth to receive your brother's blood from your hand. The divine positive law, the fifth of the Decalogue, warns, do not slay the innocent and the righteous. The deliberate killing of an innocent human person, made in the image and likeness of God, is gravely contrary to the dignity of a human being, to the golden rule, and to the holiness of God himself. The law forbidden murder is universally valid and obliges each and everyone, always and everywhere. It also forbids doing anything with the intent of bringing about a person's death. From the moment of fertilization, also referred to as conception, a new human person exists. The growth and development of this person's numerous faculties occur over time and require only nutrition, shelter, safety, and protection from harm. DNA testing easily establishes the fetus's humanity, which is not separate from its personhood, who is known to God. As we read in Jeremiah 1.5, Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. And before you were born, I consecrated you. The church, therefore, from her origin, has always affirmed the moral evil of every procured abortion, whether willed as an ends or as a means. This teaching has never changed and remains unchangeable. The connection between contraception and willful murder is patent. As mentioned earlier, contraception prevents birth subsequent to making a twofold choice the choice to engage in sexual intercourse, and the choice of an action, again for Paul, either before, at the moment of, or after sexual intercourse, that would prevent procreation. However, both fertilization and the development of new person can be prevented. Fertilization is avoided by using methods that prevent the egg and sperm from meeting. Any method employed after fertilization, however, is necessarily abortifacient. These include hormonal drugs such as the contraceptive pill, the morning after pill, and devices such as the IUD that render the womb baneful to new life, and of course, surgical abortion. Globally, surgical abortions account for some 50 million deaths annually, and chemical abortions outstrip that number. Studies have shown that globally, 50% of women abort either to postpone childbearing or because they want no more children. 20% because a child would disrupt their life. And 14% because of mother or child health issues. It is no exaggeration to say that globally, less than 6% of abortions are performed for, for the hard cases, which include rape and incest. And more than 94% to save the mother's lifestyle. The real tragedy is that, in modern society, abortion, which is willful murder, is promoted as a choice and defended as a right. In his encyclical Evangelium Vitae, number 58, John Paul II wrote, the moral gravity of procured abortion is apparent in all its truth if we recognize we're dealing with murder. So, whether choice or right, abortion remains a sin that calls to heaven for vengeance. The second sin that calls to heaven for vengeance is the sin of Sodom. The basis, essence, and philosophy of the contraceptive mentality is sterile sex. Pope Paul VI had warned of the inherent dangers of attacking the inseparable connection established by God between the unitive significance and the procreative significance, which are both inherent to the marriage act. This is um, chapter, section 12 of Humanae Vitae. Two inherent dangers did, in fact, immediately emerge from separating what God had joined together. The first held that since the use of contraception, that sane, attractive, wholesome alternative, was valid for heterosexual activity. 
there was no inherent argument against homosexual behavior, which is, after all, sex without babies. The second was that the contraceptive mentality, with its desire for sex without babies, would readily accept babies without sex. In bringing this mentality to fruition, not only is a child's human dignity and rights violated, but also life in its earliest stages is reduced to merely a commercial and in some cases disposable commodity. The sin of Sodom, which is mostly associated with homosexual behavior, is intrinsically sterile sex. Since it is a form of cohesion that is naturally not open to the transmission of life. As such, other sodomitic activities would include masturbation, bestiality, necrophilia, and similar sexual deviancies whose essence is sterile sex. Homosexuality, however, remains the flagship for the sin of Sodom. In many major cities, public parades celebrated immoral lifestyles in which naked men and women march down the streets and simulate graphic sexual acts are now acceptable as normal. Millions of people attend these parades, and many parents also bring their children, thus exposing these young minds to a lifestyle that not only leads to self-centeredness and a search for pleasure without responsibility, but is also obsessive, psychopathological, and destructive to the body. Yet even more insidious, is the blatant daily promotion of the homosexual lifestyle in the media, in advertising, in education, and scandalously in the church. The homoerotic, muscular, naked male figure, languidly reclining in the 2017 Vatican nativity scene, shows the extent to which homosexual ideation has infiltrated the church. Incredibly, behaviors such as 50 years ago were regarded as being contrary to nature and were illegal and are promoted as a lifestyle choice and defended as a right. Cicero wrote, corruptio optimi pessima, that is, the perversion of the best is the worst evil. The power of procreation is humanity's best, best gift for building a civilization of life. It has been perverted through contraception into the worst evil, a means for advancing the culture of death, the exact sin for which God himself destroyed all life in Sodom. The third sin, the oppression of the poor, foreigners, widows, and orphans. The third sin, the oppression of the poor, and specifically widows and orphans, concerns the violation of justice and is explicitly forbidden in the books of Ex Exodus and Sirach. You shall not wrong a stranger or oppress him, for you were strangers in the land of Egypt. You shall not afflict any widow or orphan. Do not afflict them. They will cry out to me. I will surely hear their cry, for I am compassionate. God will not ignore the supplications of the fatherless, nor the widow, who she, when she pours out her story. The Lord will not delay. Neither will he be patient to them till he repays man according to his deeds and the works of men according to their devices. One may well wonder how does the pressure on the poor relate to contraception. But Paul warned that contraception would cause damage to the dignity and the role of women, to marriage, to children, to families, and to society. Several studies have established that contraceptive use correlates with the falling marriage rates, to the increase in number of divorces, to the no number of people cohabiting, and to the number of single women with children born out of wedlock. Prior to the 1960s, it was generally acknowledged that men were charged with the responsibility of providing financially for their wife and children. Wives generally worked from the home, caring for and raising children. In cases where family and child poverty associated with unemployment existed, the state would provide some form of assistance. However, by the 1970s and 1980s, proponents of the Malthusian ideology, with their concern for overpopulation, advocates of eugenic prejudices against the poor, and feminist enthusiasts seeking to liberate women from the drudgery of childbearing and homekeeping, gained positions of influence in university, legal, and government circles. The 1970s saw the beginning of a host of, legal, of legislative policies and programs directed at the family, 
The net effect of these policies was manifold. Liberal divorce laws that destroyed marriage as a lifelong commitment. Social assistance that favored single rather than married motherhood. And inveigling immigrants from developing world to augment the shrinking indigenous population. God's predilection for widows and orphans arises from their having neither husband nor father to speak on their behalf. In this context, women heading single parent households are in fact widows and their children orphans since they have no husband and their children are fatherless. Their struggle is not against material poverty, but also against emotional and spiritual deprivation arising from the failure of a lifelong commitment or from the consequences of contraceptive cohabitation. Correspondingly, developing countries are wronged and oppressed when deprived of the skills of their best qualified citizens whom the developed world has recruited to sustain, to sustain their deficient workforce. Additionally, immigrants themselves experience oppression when they do not receive the same remuneration as of natives. Thus, contraception proves to be an instrument for oppression of the poor, the foreigner, the widow, and the orphan. A sin crying to heaven for vengeance. And the last sin, defrauding laborers of their wages. The last of the four sins in the realm of economic injustice and is condemned by St. James in his epistle. Behold the wages of laborers who mowed your fields, which you kept back by fraud, cry out, and the cries of the harvesters have reached the ears of the Lord of hosts. Pope Leo XIII's 1891 encyclical, Rerum Novarum, pointed out, into earlier, that a man works for the sake of procuring the necessities of life for himself and to be able to support his wife and children. He should, therefore, be paid not just a minimum wage, but a fair wage, which must include the possibility of him being able to save and better himself financially. The popes were aware of the social and economic changes that were taking place, and Pope Pius XI's 1931 encyclical, Quadragissimo Anno, dealt with the topic of reconstructing the entire social order that it might conform to the teaching of the gospel. From the late 19th century, men's wages and jobs were protected and enhanced as the mainstay of families under the concept of a family wage. The concept of the family wage used to refer to the various ways in which the living standards of married couple household were sustained, as husband and wife covered the task of childbearing through mutual support. As more women entered the workforce in the 1970s, equal pay and opportunity legislation undid the structure with the enforcement of a tax system based on the number of dependents on an income. With more consumer goods available and living standards rising, married women were enticed into paid work to afford these extras. The net effect was a trend towards living standards based on double incomes, which locked women into paid work with repercussions for childbearing. This, together with changes in the labor market, a reduction in the number of full-time male jobs, an increase in part-time and female employment, rocketing inflation, legislation which caused the virtual disappearance of affordable rented accommodation, made it very difficult for unskilled and semi-skilled young men to earn enough to support a family, with the result that many women and men were reluctant to marry at all. Cohabitation, especially in low-income communities, began to replace marriage, since single mothers could receive welfare benefits. Further, married people were taxed as if they had discretionary income of singles, which resulted in a rising number of sterile marriages, since many married couples felt unable to afford children. Although the majority of the population continued to see the role of husband and father as that of a breadwinner, employment trends made it very difficult for the average marriage man to financially support his family, thus deprived of the means of obtaining the necessities of life for himself and his dependents, as taught in Rerum Novarum, he is being defrauded of his wages. A sin crying to heaven for vengeance. So, how do we conclude? Having redeemed the people of Israel from slavery in Egypt, guided them through the desert, 
fed them with manna from heaven, taught them to trust in God, transmit to them God's will in the Ten Commandments, promised them a prophet like himself to whom they should listen, Moses warned them lastly, saying, I call heaven and earth to witness against you this day that I have set before you life and death, blessing and curse. Therefore, choose life, that you and your descendants may live, loving the Lord your God, obeying his voice, and cleaving to him, for that means life to you, and length of days, that you may dwell in the land which the Lord swore to your fathers, to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob, to give them. The prophet, the prophet promised is Christ, the Son of God, who redeems us from our sins by his blood, feeds us with his body, guides and teaches us by his church, against which he promised the gates of hell would never prevail. Fifty years ago, Humanae Vitae placed before the world a choice between life and death and blessings and curse. In rejecting the church's perennial teaching and opting for contraception, the world chose death and the curses that paved the way for it, enslavement to unruly and deviant sexual passions, flouting the natural law and the abandonment of reason, rejection of moral absolutes, murder of the innocent, dissolution of the family resulted in oppressed women, dissolution men, dislocated youth, virulently sexually transmitted diseases, and since sin has social consequences, aging populations and dying nations. Going beyond simple knowledge of specific doctrines, we ought to keep, we ought to accept in faith that the church's doctrine is both true and good, that God expects us to live in accord with that doctrine, and that any perceived difficulties are surmountable with the help of his grace. Paul VI's defense of the church's doctrine on contraception in the face of massive opposition is a clear sign of the charism of infallibility in action. It ranks with the vacillating Clement VII's refusal to annul Henry VIII's marriage in the face of all the conventional wisdom of the time regarding papal authority. In both cases, we worship God and fulfill his saving will for us by respecting by living the objective moral order. Authentic respect for a person means to help him embrace this truth. No matter how much sin may have lulled him into wrongly thinking that observing God's law is impossible, that's unnecessary and undesirable. Pope Francis's establishment of a papal commission to re-examine and re-evaluate humanae vitae is viewed with much foreboding by faithful Catholics who, in the current climate, fear it as a Trojan horse for sanctioning the use of contraception. This fear arises from various papal utterances, including, there are many ways to avoid pregnancy, from his approving the use of contraceptives to prevent pregnancy in areas where the Zika virus is prevalent, and from his inviting abortion advocates and population controllers, such as Paul Ehrlich and Jeffrey Sachs, to various Vatican meetings and onto various Vatican committees. Further, his description of Emma Bonino, an illegal abortion provider, a euthanasia advocate, and co-founder of the Information Center on Sterilization Abortion, as one of Italy's forgotten greats, is as disturbing as his appointment of Rabbi Abraham Steinberg and Professor Nigel Bigger to membership of the newly constituted Pontifical Academy for Life. While Steinberg holds that the unborn child has no human status before 40 days, though after 40 days, it has a certain status of a human being, but not full status, Bigger holds that abortion is permissible before 18 weeks because, he says, it is not clear that a human fetus is the same kind of thing as an adult. Additionally, Father Maurizio Chiodi, a moral theologian of the New Academy for Life, presented a public lecture entitled Rereading Humanae Vitae in the Light of Amoris Laetitia at the Pontifical Gregorian University in Rome. In his lecture, he declared, there are, quote, circumstances, I refer to Amoris Laetitia, chapter 8, 
that precisely for the sake of responsibility require contraception. In such circumstances, he said, quote, an artificial method for the regulation of birth could be recognized as an act of responsibility that is carried out, not in order to radically reject the gift of a child, but because in those situations, responsibility calls the couple and the family to other forms of welcome and hospitality. Although Catholic morality holds that the ends do not justify the means and that circumstances do not change the morality of a human act, Father Chiodi believes that an individual or couple jointly can commit the mortal sin of contraception as an act of responsibility and, depending on the circumstances, may even be compelled to do so. Here he takes his cues from Pope Francis's inferences in Amoris Laetitia, while ignoring the brutal reality of the abortifacient effect of the most commonly used contraceptive methods. The news of the establishment of a papal commission to review and reevaluate humanity, vitae, whilst filling the encyclical's detractors with frenzy joy, should also fill faithful Catholics with an evangelical zeal to study, to unravel, to explain, expound, share, and make known as widely as possible the gospel truths taught by and in which over the past 50 years have been verified by the real life experiences of billions of ordinary men, women, and children. Also needed is prayer that the Holy Spirit, who has guided and protected the church these past two millennia, will continue to ensure that, despite the howling of the wolves, and the weakness and deafening silence of the shepherds, sin will not be institutionalized within the church. The teaching of nature itself, the natural law of human reason, and the experience of the last half century all irrefutably affirm that contraception is profoundly harmful, is unnatural, damages marriages, hurts families, and gives rise to great social injustices and injuries. The stark reality is that sin and particularly the grievous sin of contraception has personal, social, and divine consequences. May the intercession of our most blessed lady defend us, defend our faith. May she obtain the graces for our Pope and our bishops and our priests to preach the truth, the gospel truth, given to us in Humanae Vitae by Pope Paul VI. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Amen. Our Lady of Fatima, 